Chilean President has announced that he will enact the constitutional reform that allowed the 10% of private pensions funds. The World Health Organization has warned that the first use of vaccines against COVID-19 cannot be expected until early 2021. Kenyan health authorities reported a record number of new COVID-19 cases on Thursday. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the South. I'm Laura Palmero. Chilean President Sebastián Piñera has announced that he will enact the constitutional reform that will allow for the early withdrawal of 10% of private pensions funds. The announcement late this Thursday came after Chile's Chamber of Deputies approved changes that the Senate introduced to the bill, with the support of more than two-thirds of the parliamentarians. A large number of deputies of the ruling party National Renewal, who abstained when the bill was first voted on, this time supported it, making for a total of 160 votes in favor. The move represents a huge victory for Chilean activists and organizations who have stressed the need to access the funds given the economic crisis in the country. As experts predict a busy hurricane season, the tropics are currently facing three separate systems threatening distribution in Pacific, Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico. Category 3 Hurricane Douglas in the Pacific Ocean currently threatens the Hawaiian Islands and is on track to potentially bring heavy rainfall and flash flooding over the weekend. Meanwhile, Tropical Depression 8 is spinning about 430 miles from the city of Corpus Christi in Texas. If its wind speed reaches 39 miles per hour, it will be named Tropical Storm Hannah. At the same time, in the Atlantic Tropical Storms, Gonzalo is expected to become a hurricane Friday as it moves west toward to the Caribbean. The president of the Supreme Electoral Tribunal of Bolivia, Salvador Romero, announced a new election date on Thursday. The elections, which were scheduled to take place in September, have been postponed and will now take place on Sunday, October 18th, with a possible second round on November 29th. According to the electoral authorities, the new date provides better conditions for the protection of health, as well as favoring necessary logistical deployment across the country. In a statement, the electoral tribunal urged citizens, state powers, political forces and candidates, the civil society organizations and the media to support this decision. This Thursday, Cuban Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez tweeted about the Cuban government's readiness to treat Bolivia's COVID-19 patients. According to a statement issued by the Cuban Foreign Ministry, despite the attacks launched by the de facto government against Cuban collaborators in Bolivia, a clinic belonging to Cuba located in La Paz will be open to offer treatment to Bolivian coronavirus patients as an act of humanity in the face of the aggression to which the island is subject, even in the face of the pandemic. The Cuban Solidarity Campaign in the United Kingdom has stressed that Cuba's health care and solidarity are an inspiration to the world. As part of the activities organized by the campaign, Jeremy Corbyn, MP, former leader of the Labour Party, will join Miami Five hero Fernando Gonzalez, an online meeting next Monday to look at Cuba's incredible international response to the global health crisis, as well as its ongoing struggle against the U.S. blockade. Director of the Cuban Solidarity Campaign, Rob Miller, stressed that Cuban health professionals have treated people suffering from the coronavirus in the Caribbean, the Americas and Africa, as well as Italy and Andorra. He also noted that the UK has cooperated with Cuba to support the posting of two Cuban medical brigades to the British overseas territories of Anguilla and the Turks and Caicos Islands. Venezuelan Vice President Delcy Rodriguez offered an update on COVID-19 figures this Thursday. 
The vice president reported 438 new locally transmitted COVID-19 cases and 11 imported cases, of which 10 came from Colombia and one from Peru. Rodriguez also noted that the capital district recorded the highest number of the new cases at 108. Meanwhile, over 7,700 patients have recovered from the virus, while 5,732 cases remain active. The COVID-19 death toll in Venezuela stands at 129. The government of St. Kitts and Nevis is preparing to welcome tourists but has not yet decided on a day to reopen its borders. According to a statement issued on Wednesday by the Minister of Tourism, Lindsay Grant, the phase approach will see the country fully opening at a local level to begin with, then regionally and lastly internationally. The minister announced that the government is starting training programs this week, which will run through August 27th for workers in the hospitality sector, including restaurants, bars and tour operators. Grant assured that the country has already flattened the curve of the coronavirus epidemic and that the next big task will be resuming tourism operations. St. Kitts and Nevis has reported just 17 cases and no COVID-19 fatalities. Puerto Rico has abandoned its reopening plans after the coronavirus spag was reported in the island. Governor Wanda Vasquez has ordered bars, gyms, marinas, theaters and casinos to shut again until at least July 31st. In addition, sales of alcohol will be prohibited after 7 p.m. and restaurant capacity will be limited to 50 percent. One of the mayor's issues Puerto Rico has faced is the lack of discipline in the use of masks and social distancing by tourists. The country has reported more than 4,500 cases and a death toll of almost 200 people. I will be right back after this break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. Researchers are making good progress in developing vaccines against COVID-19, but their first use cannot be expected until early 2021, a World Health Organization expert said on Wednesday. Dr. Mike Ryan, executive director of the World Health Organization Health Emergency Program, noted that the agency is working to ensure fair vaccine distribution, but in the meantime, it is key to curb the spread of the virus, as daily new cases around the globe are near record levels. He stressed that while good progress is being made with several vaccines now in phase three trials, which have proven to be safe and generated an immune response. But realistically, it's going to be the first part of next year before we start seeing people getting vaccinated. That's the first sort of uh, issue. Second issue is we've vaccines are never 100 percent effective. They, they, they generate immunity in most people. Uh, for some vaccines, it's only some people. For some vaccines, like measles, they're highly effective and 95 percent of people are protected. We don't know where we are with this. So we're going to have to wait and see how effective the vaccine is going to be and how long will the protection last. Thousands of Airbus workers staged protests outside production sites across Spain on Thursday against the European plane maker's decision to cut over 1,600 jobs over the next few months. Airbus announced in June that it would cut more than 15,000 jobs worldwide in a move it claimed would save work company operations. The majority of the layoffs are set to take place in Europe. Protests were seen for Spanish cities against the job cuts and calling on the government to make investments to warranty long-term employment union representatives have noted that strikes will continue if workers' demands are not met. It's not a problem of redundancies or excess workforce. It is a problem of recuperating the amount of work. Also, there is the issue of Airbus Spain in the European Consortium. We have to achieve a better position in the holding. We ask for the intervention of the central and regional governments. From here, we ask Pedro Sanchez that he leads the transition of the aerospace sector to a central role in the country's economy. He needs to take advantage of the push that the agreement taking to the heart of Europe. He needs to take advantage of this strength in Europe to protect the interest of Airbus. 
A new increase in migrants arriving on the Italian island of Lampedusa has prompted authorities to transfer some of them to the mainland. The migrant center of the island is currently hosting more than 800 people, four times its capacity. Hundreds of thousands of people have sailed from North Africa across the Mediterranean in recent years, risking their lives on boats operated by human traffickers in the hope of reaching Europe. Thousands have died along the way. There are fresh concerns over the welfare of migrants held at the detention centers in the face of the coronavirus pandemic. Greek authorities warned on Thursday of Turkey's intended exploration activities in the eastern Mediterranean. The Greek government points out that the announcement of the Turkish exploration activities in parts of the Greek continental shelf with illegal sailors constitutes an escalation of tension in the region. At the same time, it shows Turkey's continuous wrongdoing and its utter disregard for international law. Firefighters and water-dropping aircraft continue to fight to contain a large wildfire in southern Greece on Thursday. Seven villages have been evacuated since the fire broke out on Wednesday, while around 20 water-dropping planes and helicopters have assisted over 300 firefighters on the ground. Meanwhile, local authorities noted that the fire had destroyed farmland and seriously damaged at least 10 homes. Wildfires are common during Greece's hot and dry summers. Austrian and German authorities noted on Thursday that the European Union and the Western Balkan countries will implement a new operational platform to combat illegal migration. The participating states have agreed to implement a platform which will be located in Vienna. Its goal will be to coordinate the measures of the European Union, the states of the European Union, as well as the measures of the Western Balkan partners when it comes to secure the borders, when it comes to thinking about how we can faster deport those who have no right of residence. As far as I know, there is no member state which doesn't share the opinion that we need a new system of rules for migration. Migration will keep us occupied for many, many, many years to come. And together, we also share the conviction that no member state can solve this global problem on its own. This is the moment now. Europe cannot fail twice on migration. Migration is shaping our societies, is shaping our policies, is one of the key components for our systems. According to a United Nations Development Program report released on Thursday, the immediate introduction of a temporary basic income could slow the COVID-19 surge and provide a lifeline for the world's poorest people. The agency estimates that it would cost governments upwards of $199 billion per month to provide guaranteed basic income to the 2.7 billion people living below or just above the poverty line in 132 developing countries. The UNDP stresses that the pandemic continues to infect more than 1.5 million people per week, particularly in developing countries, where 7 out of 10 workers make a living through informal markets and can not earn any money if they are stuck at home. The report proposes what it describes as a feasible measures that is urgently needed, claiming it would be enable close to 3 billion people to stay at home. And we have more stories coming up after this very final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. Kenyan health authorities reported the highest number of new COVID-19 cases in a day since the outbreak of the pandemic in the country on Thursday. Today the news is not any better. Today is the day that we have actually recorded the highest number of positive cases since this pandemic struck. Out of the 6,754 samples tested in the last 24 hours, we have 796 people having tested positive for this disease. And this brings the total number of positive cases in the country to 15,601, pushing our cumulative sample size so far tested to 200,061,027. 200, From these cases, 
We have three foreigners. We have 503 males, 293 females. The youngest is one... And Kenya health authorities also reported over 7,000 recoveries from the virus while thanking medical personnel for their efforts in the fight against COVID-19. Good news is that 378 patients have recovered from the disease. Out of this number, 199 are from the home-based care program, while 179 are from various hospitals, bringing the total number of recoveries to 7,135. And we continue to salute our healthcare workers for this commendable work that has enabled us to achieve this result. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa announced this Thursday that public schools will close again starting on Monday. The decision comes as South Africa experiences a spike in COVID-19 cases. Cabinet has decided today that all public schools should take a break for the next four weeks. Now, this has also been the experience in a number of other countries where schools have opened and have also had to close due to the circumstances that each country has had to confront. According to the World Health Organization's regional director, around 10,000 healthcare workers, most of them nurses, have been infected with the novel coronavirus in Africa. That the majority of those who have been infected have been uh, nurses, but we have had all categories of healthcare workers, doctors, laboratory technicians, um, and even some of the people who are providing ancillary support in healthcare settings infected. Uh, about the uh, COVID organics, we are also uh, working. Uh, a, a protocols have been uh, uh, established and the both team, uh, WHO and uh, uh, national teams are, are working uh, to push forward uh, the, the, the clinical trial uh, related to the COVID uh, organics. So our collaboration is there and uh, we are monitoring the situation that is changing uh, quite fast. The leader of Mali's opposition June 5th movement, Imam Mahmoud Diko, has stated that nothing has changed following the mediation visit by West African head of state to Mali's capital Bamako this Thursday. Nothing has changed yet. We have been told nothing as far as I understand. I really wanted to say it very sincerely. And I say it and I will say it again. We are a people that stand. We are not a submissive or resigned people. I would rather die a martyr death than a traitor death. The young people who lost their lives did not lose them for nothing. If they have really come together on this, I think that nothing has been done for the moment. United Nations authorities have condemned the killing of four aid workers and a security guard armed groups in Nigeria. The five workers were abducted last month while traveling on the main road in the Nigerian state of Borno. And from Nigeria, our humanitarian coordinator and resident coordinator, Edward Cologne, condemned the gruesome killing of four aid workers and a security guard by non-state armed, non armed groups. Nearly 8 million people were in need of urgent life-saving assistance in the Northeast uh, at the beginning of the year. And today, 10.6 million people are in urgent need of support as the conflict-affected states battle the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Cologne urged all armed parties to step up their responsibilities and stop targeting aid workers and civilians. And we have come to the end of this news brief, but as Friday marks the 15th anniversary of the launch of the our multimedia platform Telesur, to leave you with a song produced with Cuban band Buena Fe and featuring a host of female Latin American voices. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website and our social media pages. For Telesur English, I'm Laura Palmero. Thank you for watching. Enjoy the music. Sonriendo entre los feroces arquitectos de zarpazos Señal que no pierde el paso Amplificando otras voces Las voces desobedientes, mestizas de ese chalobre Indio, campesino y pobre, más humano que clientes Semiótica que entra al juego desde la piel del sufrido Júbilo que bajo fuego más se yergue convencido Y sudaca con espuelas, ni parlante mal Negativas verdaderas ante el falso positivo.